you are like yes, one of the yes. again? I am. Right, I'm on the yeah, I think, should we start? Yes, I think we'll make a start. Um, I think uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. I think we should, we'll have fire drill in the next five or ten minutes. Maybe. Yeah. Which should hopefully be nothing but a short interruption. Um, but it just, I just remember usually on Thursday afternoon, so don't be alarmed unless it carries on. Um, and we're also videoing the seminar portion, or the sort of lecture portion of this. Daisy and James kindly agreed to that. Um, but we'll switch it off for the discussion session um, this afternoon. But just a, this is a joint forum image and seminar. Um, and uh, very happy to introduce James King and Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg, who are two designers who are interested in sort of futures of biotechnologies. Uh, and they've been visiting fellows at the forum this week, um, and Daisy's been doing quite a lot of work with Jane this week as well on the new synthetic aesthetics project. So I'm not really going to say anything much to introduce them because I think they'll probably introduce themselves and their work uh, to us over the course of the seminar. But maybe just to say that um, the first time I really heard about James and Daisy was in connection with a mysterious metal suitcase um, that was being paraded around the synthetic biology jamboree in November was causing much uh, uh, discussion and attention, and I think they're going to tell us a little bit more about the contents of the suitcase today. Um, so they're going to talk to us, I think, for 45 minutes or an hour or so, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion about the intersections between their work and the kinds of things that people around the table are doing. So, so, so. Thank you, Emma, and thank you to the forum for inviting us, and the Synthetic Aesthetics Project that I'm here for as well. And, um, yeah, we're gonna, we'll present kind of a chronology of different projects we've worked on and working on together. And then any questions, please, be really, really good to get your insight into the work we've been doing. Because um, we're here today because we've been working with biotechnologies, but neither of us are scientists. And we're not social scientists, we're designers. We're both trained in design. I studied architecture first and James studied graphic design. And we're both um, kind of now starting to ask questions like this, which aren't... Um, the normal questions that designers tend to ask. So when you're faced with the entire living kingdoms as a materials library, what do you design? And how do scientists think about the long-term future of the research they're doing in the lab now? So these were two questions that came out of a project we did collaboratively last year with the Cambridge University iGEM team, which is how the suitcase happened. But we'll describe kind of how we got to that point first. So James is going to start um, with one of his first projects. So um, this isn't about synthetic biology, it's, uh, it's another um, form of biotechnology, uh, tissue culture. And um, I did this in, in 2006 when I was studying at the Royal College of Art. And um, it's quite an old project now, but uh, it's, it kind of started my interest in this whole area. And um, so it's a good place to start now. Um, so it's based on a real technology uh, that allows us to take a small sample of animal tissue and encourage it to grow separate from the original animal's body to form an edible piece of meat. And this is what's called in vitro cultured meat, or bitterness meat. Um, so imagining that this technology is successful and becomes the most cost-effective, the highest quality, the most humane way of producing our meat, then it's easy to imagine it becoming a normal, everyday thing at some point in the future. So what will be different about this meat? What size will it be if it's no longer limited by the size of any animal? What shape will it have if it's no longer limited by the anatomy of any animal? How much will it cost, and who will buy it? Would we be happy eating something that looked as unappetizing as this, which is what tissue culture looks like when it's done in the lab? Um, well, perhaps not. Perhaps a particularly enterprising chef of tomorrow will become bored by the formless, shapeless food, and will strive to add authenticity to his creations. He does his research and learns about these historical animals called cows, he becomes excited by old textbooks with false colour illustrations of their anatomy, such as these cross-sections through a cow's stomach. He selects the parts that he finds most interesting, not the boring bits we eat today, but the more intricate and beautiful patterns found in the abdomen and the brain. He makes a mould into which he can culture the cells into a steak, and serves the results in his restaurant to an appreciative clientele, who are also hungry for a more authentic form of meat and willing to pay for it. So the, um, the idea behind this project um, was to take my initial kind of disgust of learning about the technology in that it seems completely unnatural and weird and freakish um, and to try and not do the obvious thing which would be to make a kind of a David Cronenberg interpretation of some awful genetic engineering travesty on a plate 
but instead to try and take a more sensitive approach and and deal with an aesthetic that um, is kind of walks the line between something which is unappetizing and appetizing, and then really presented on a plate for someone to look at and go. Their first result would be, hmm, does that look tasty or not? And then their second question might be, would I want to eat it? And then they'd start thinking about the implications of this technology and also their relationship to it. So by creating these kinds of tangible objects that embody a particular vision of the future, it becomes possible to discuss them and to test their desirability. So, for example, the debate about whether biotechnological meat is good or bad can become less abstract. And you get to ask all sorts of new questions like, how much should it cost? Does it look appetizing? And would you want to eat it? So this is an exhibition that happened at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in uh, early 2008. And um, the tangibility of the work also allows it the possibility to propagate through the media very easily. So this is the March 2008 issue of Wired magazine. And unlike a piece of art which you kind of experience in a gallery, because it's, it's more like a, a piece of visual communication when you take a photograph of it, it can find itself next to head and shoulders adverts and all sorts of things in, in popular culture in general, which is a, a really powerful way to kind of um, bring people into the understanding about these new technologies and, and to kind of engage with them. Um, but there are problems, because this, this is another article with the, which uses a very similar image, um, but it's talking about uh, meat without the animal. And um, it's not really made clear in this article that this is a, a kind of an illustration in a way, or it's being used as an illustration. Um, it might appear as a kind of a real thing. Um, so it's not obviously real, it's made of plastic. Um, but this is the real thing. This is a, a piece of um, lab-grown meat made by Oren Katz and Ayan Atzer, who are two artists who work extensively with tissue cultures in uh, Symbiotica, which is a, an art and science laboratory space in, in the University of Western Australia, which Daisy will talk about in a bit. Um, so what you see on the left is a, a scaffold, that kind of spongy texture, and then on the right is the finished steak. Um, it's only about three centimetres long, as you might be able to see from the scale at the bottom. And it was the first ever piece of meat to be cultured and eaten. And um, it's very interesting that it wasn't done by science, but done by art. And uh, this is something that's, um, that's, something that's uh, you wouldn't really normally expect art to do. Um, so up until this point, I've never dealt with... Um, this kind of end, the lab-based, the wet buy technology. I kind of kept it at arm's length and researched about this and, and then made, made the work. But um, after the, the Museum of Modern Art exhibition, I met Oren Katz, who, whose work was also in it. They were side by side in the exhibition. And he didn't like my work very much because uh, it's made of plastic and he spends all this time in the lab <laughs> really kind of grafting. Um, uh, but he was kind enough to invite myself along to the Symbiotica Biotech Art Workshop in Stavanger in Norway, and this is where uh, Daisy and I met. Um, so here we are. Uh, Oren's the guy wearing black in the back of the laboratory. Um, <laughs> he's quite a gothic character. He's never seen bed in the lab coat. Um, so we learn all sorts of things like how to extract our own DNA, uh, how to cultivate bacteria, um, how to genetically engineer or genetically modify bacteria. So this is, uh, this is E. coli bacteria we inserted, uh, we, we injected with the jellyfish gene to make them glow. Um, and what was surprising was how easy it was to do because all you needed was a, a bucket of ice, a hot water bath and the right chemicals and, and you could transform them in about 10 minutes time and leave them overnight and then you would end up with um, E. coli bacteria with jellyfish genes in them, which is kind of amazing. Um, so and all the other thing we did was to, to learn about uh, lab equipment we actually built our own so it's kind of a DIY uh, biology kind of ethos to the, to the, the course of the workshop we did as well and lastly um, we learned how to culture living cells so this is the same technology that's used to make this edible meat and the same technology that I based my first project on um, but it was very interesting for me to work with it directly in the lab because I realized that it was much more difficult to work with both technically and ethically so um, technically we were trying to stop it from uh, um, uh, being infected from spores or from other bacteria that would, uh, that would kill the culture. And ethically, because um, we were working with human tissue, and in particular um, HeLa cells, which I'm sure most people in this room would know the history of those cells and, and why they're difficult or at least um, had some controversy associated with them in the past. 
Um, but as these technologies get nearer, I think it's increasingly important to get, engage with them on their own terms. So I don't think um, I, I, I would want to keep the, the science at arm le arm's length. And, and from now, we'll, we'll start to talk about how we've engaged with scientists directly rather than just you know, find out something and make a project about it. Um, so in the workshop, uh, we were with a, a group of artists in a lab. And there's a strong history of, of art and science kind of working together. In a way, they're quite parallel subjects um, in that uh, they both happen in quite rarefied spaces in the lab or in the gallery. Um, and uh, they're not necessarily involved with the everyday world so much in, in that science is about um, finding out new things uh, or, or truths and, and art is about, um, I, I don't really know what art is about, but I think <laughs> you can kind of understand the, the analogy maybe, I hope. Um, and as designers, uh, we, we, we often work with, um, say, engineers, and uh, their links through, for example, architecture and structural engineering might be a design discipline linked together with an engineering kind of discipline. Um, and traditionally, design is considered to be applied art, and engineering is considered to be applied science. But what we're really interested in is what happens when designers like us go and kind of talk to scientists and um, whether that interaction can be useful or, or meaningful in any way. And the projects from, from now on will, will, will show what we've done kind of in the lab, working directly with scientists. Okay, so um, another way of looking at this is it's a diagram from a uh, dissertation that I wrote at the Royal College of Art. I was looking at how science is sort of functioning at every scale, whether it's from kind of microbiology to astrophysics, because you know, science is related to everything, whereas um, the science I've been focusing on, which is molecular biology, in particular synthetic biology, is happening at the kind of at the microbe and below. Whereas as a designer, my expertise is at these scales, which is kind of the human scale, social scale, kind of global networks. That's what I've been trained to think about. And I'm curious how these two kind of planes can interact, and if there's useful insights that we can bring to the laboratory, and kind of help to connect the macroscopic and the microscopic scale, and what those interactions might be. And in terms of kind of other questions, what might a designer do in a biotech revolution? What is the designer's role in this? Um, are there new, you know, a designer's almost like a social agent. The, our expertise is this human scale, and scientists quite rightly are focusing on the kind of microscopic, because that's their level of, their, their kind of scale of expertise. And how um, can we think differently about how, that kind of new kind of skills that designers might have to learn? So I'm going to explain this through the field of synthetic biology, which I'm not sure how many people in this room are familiar with. Does anyone know what synthetic biology is? Roughly? Two. I think Jane knows. Okay, well, for those who don't, um, this is one definition. It's a new field, um, and it can be defined as the design and construction of new biological parts and devices and systems, and the redesign of existing natural biological systems for useful purposes. In short, it's the kind of application of an engineering ideology to biology. As biology is previously kind of celebrated as chaos, or chaotic the celebration and kind of discovery of an understanding of how biological systems work. It's very different from how we see engineering, which is about simplicity. So we're applying kind of the kind of human constructs which we're more familiar with now. This is you know, some information technology, applying those kinds of hierarchies to biology. Interesting things will ensue. So we're moving from this kind of appreciation of well this kind of celebration of chaos. So this is part of the E. coli painted by a molecular biologist from the Scripps Institute in the US um, called David Goodsell, who does a lot of paintings in his spare time. So here we see the flagella on the top left-hand corner of the painting, and it's just showing all the different molecules that are interacting in this kind of chaotic cell. Um, and then to apply engineering to that is kind of, is the ideas are coming from two very different directions. So standardization, abstraction, and decoupling are some of the main principles of synthetic biology idea that you could kind of black box DNA devices, so you don't need to know what's happening at the molecular scale. And we can decouple the molecular scale technology from the design of systems. So these are very different ways of thinking about genetic engineering. And Drew Endy, who's one of the kind of proponents of this field, is saying things like this, you know, my motivation is that years from now, anybody who wants to can dream up a useful biological system and pull it off without having to go through this whole big research process to do it. There's a very different approach to the kind of more tinkering approach that genetic engineering is now, where we're trying to you know, make bespoke systems to having a uniform way of approaching it. And this engineering approach creates tensions, and so Tom Knight, who's another major figure in the field, 
saying things like an alternative to understanding complexity to get rid of it, which is pure engineering as uh, a <coughs> style of training in architecture. I can enjoy that very much. Um, so this um, quote by Theodore von Kármán was actually used when we were at Cambridge in a lecture last year, James and I. And the whole two-week crash course we did in synthetic biology was opened with this, which is scientists discover the world that exists, engineers create the world that never was. So um, this kind of celebration of complexity versus simplicity is interesting. And as designers, um, we're kind of curious about this side as well, the social and cultural and ethical implications of these new technologies. So this is from a lecture by Tom Murray at the Hastings Centre, the bioethics think tank in upstate New York. He gave the Nuffield Annual Bioethics Lecture at the Royal Society last year. And he was talking about, you know, how do we value this in terms of, is it an inappropriate elevation of humans or a degradation of nature? And how are we going to kind of untangle whether this is about identities or interests? And he suggested that we may require compelling narratives as well as philosophical arguments. So James are like, compelling narratives, that's what we can make. So for us, that's one of the kind of, the things that we feel that we can offer is actually kind of visualising, making tangible these questions. And find unique questions. So I'll introduce, um, this is one of my projects that I graduated with from the RCA last year called the Synthetic Kingdom. Uh, kind of the idea is to introduce some of the main principles of synthetic biology and some of the different kind of themes within it. And it's set slightly in the future. So let's start with that. Is that not working now? Do you need to switch the speakers on? Okay. Okay. Synthetic biology is turned into the living kingdoms for its materials library. We no longer have to rely on polluting petrochemicals. Instead, we can feature from an existing organism. We extract a cell, then identify the chromosome that contains the DNA code we need. been an interesting design proposal to make. Um, it's for a new branch of the tree of life. So 
had led to a lot of interesting discussions with scientists and um, evolutionary biologists and people I never really expected to be having discussions with about these things. Um, so it's been very useful, but the role of the designer in that is something that would be good to, to question after. Um, so the project started off with this animation, and um, what I was trying to do was kind of lay out all my research in synthetic biology to date. So I began with the promises. Um, I interviewed um, scientists, collaborated with different scientists, um, and tried to design a range of products that we might anticipate. And um, <coughs> kind of looking at different papers that are existing and kind of promises of research that may happen. So from the very simplest, maybe synthetic biology will offer unlimited energy, and we'll be able to use the enzyme luciferase, um, from glowworms to create new kinds of energy sources. So maybe like low-level lighting will be kind of produced biologically. And then kind of there's other papers where we're looking into things like manufacturing. So perhaps we can use, this is actually um, an existing um, organism called the Venus flower basket, and it makes this incredible structure out of glass, and it's a kind of sea sponge, um, and it's basically transforming the sea into fibre optics. And scientists actually looking at it for these kind of glass fibres that the, the creature makes for itself. And will we be able to co-opt that kind of biological system, perhaps to make the sea into a manufacturing site um, for telecommunications? And what, this is the cup from the animation. Like, how would we feel about drinking out of something that originally came from our hair or fingernails? Um, maybe we'll have disposable plastics that are kind of more akin to the kinds of materials we used to use, which are sort of bone, skin, um, kind of plant-based things. So we used to have a natural materials palette. How will this change how we feel about kind of the everyday objects? Foods and pharmaceuticals. So perhaps we'll have food colorants um, or printing inks or kind of things used within things we eat that um, come from naturally sourced origins. But then this whole debate about is it natural or is it synthetic becomes quite interesting. So here I chose that the CMY of cyan, magenta and yellow come from um, kind of modified jellyfish genes. Um, which already exists in kind of biological catalogues. But then the black, the scientist I work with at Imperial, he's like, oh, I don't know where we'll get that from. Perhaps we could use like the pigment that makes animal hair black. Um, that comes from you know, a certain enzyme. And he's like, we'll pick a black animal. And I was like, what about a dachshund? So how would you feel about eating something that came from a dachshund? Um, bioelectronics. So one of the <coughs> promises that we'll have biological computing. Well, what, is, you know, what is this? And how will we get it to sync up um, with the kind of systems we have now? So this is a lunch timer that turns pink at lunchtime. How would we get bacteria kind of to be in sync with the human circadian rhythm? And what about the things we already have which are electronic? One of the promises that we'll have this kind of new sustainable biological landscape, but something like a carbon monoxide monitor that you'd have in your kitchen, what's that like? A, what's the biological alternative of that? Would you have to feed it and look after it? Would we no longer have kind of pets and gardens that would be so busy feeding all the devices in our house? These are the kinds of questions I was trying to kind of ask, and uh, what does this stuff look like? And these are all the problems I was kind of coming across. These are microbe chips, so will we use the same paradigm for what we have now? Like, you know, this is a computer, I understand what it looks like, but how will we fit new kind of biological systems into the existing products we have? So then it's kind of the question of the tree of life, and if all these features for all these things are coming from across the tree of life, well, we need this new branch to be able to fit everything into. It's an engineering solution for an engineering problem. Um, and within that, what is the Linnaean system of taxonomy from things from like an entirely artificial synthetic cell or you know, a kind of co a computer that's made in Japan that's made out of a bacteria? Where will we place that within the structures we already use? So, for example, um, so you can't read, it's quite small. Um, the product name, is that the species? It's the manufacturer, the genus, how will we begin to organise these things and how will it kind of happen across national borders? And then what are the compromises? This all sounds very seductive and I'm very excited about this kind of future will arrive in, but how are we going to control these things? And bacteria don't understand IP, um, kind of laws, boundaries, international borders, and how will we kind of recycle and control these things? And we're full of bacteria. The human microbiome is kind of a rich source of bacteria. Um, and how will we stop these things manufacturing as we've designed them to do, but not quite where we intended them to be? So part of this project was a range of um, synthetic pathologies from the future. So here we have printing inks which have escaped onto, um, you know, they're not quite where they're meant to be, they're starting to build up on someone's teeth as a form of plaque, but plaque is just a biofilm made from bacteria. Maybe we'll learn to accept these beautiful diseases, they're kind of an unexpected compromise. So here's... Um, a lung tumour from a heavy smoker where they've kind of caught two different infections and one is a carbon monoxide sensing bacteria 
another one of glass producing bacteria and they've suddenly a little bit of horizontal gene transfer and they've managed to synthesize a new organism that unfortunately ended up with a rather large problem. But um, the kind of the questions that this, there's a whole series of diseases, which I won't show all of them, but they were kind of culminated in what would the ultimate synthetic pathology be? If the body became the site of manufacture, um, would you leave your body to business, to science, or perhaps to art? And what was the ultimate disease? And for me, that was um, colonic alchemy, and the waste matter turns to gold. Because mm. the gut currently is you know, rich in, in bacteria. It's the most unloved organ in the human body, but maybe one day when our worldview changes that bacteria become very important, it suddenly becomes the, kind of the most precious and profitable organ in the body. So that was um, one project I worked on. My mum's called Growth Assembly with Sasha Profla, and we were looking at um, manufacturing systems and the way the way the world's unsta unsustainable. We were like, well, we should come up with a new system. So it was kind of scratching our head, and we were looking to various projects. And we were like, synthetic biology obviously is a, could be a source of the solution for this. And we looked at this map where things are travelling all over the world in different shipping routes and how it's unsustainable. And through our research, we ended up, um, I went up to Cambridge to meet with Jim Hasselhoff of um, the Hasselhoff Lab at Cambridge University, and he's working on plant morphology and synthetic biology with plants and the way cells grow and differentiate, which is not traditional synthetic biology. Um, and after about an hour and a half, I was like, what is it for? Why are you, you know, how can this, what could this be? I understand what bacteria in terms of synthetic biology, or what is this new thing? He said, well, maybe one day we'll be able to grow products inside plants. We went back to London, like, Sasha, we've got the solution, it's this. And then we went, well, how, would, how does that work? What do they look like? Would you have, these actually parts of a gun, would you need um, different, see, you know, different plants for the different parts? And how does, that, how does that work? And what does this new industry look like? Is it more like a greenhouse, the visions of the future we've seen before? So we decided to design an object from this future. And we like, what, what's going to be every day? Would it be like a toaster or a kettle? We decided that it's the herbicide sprayer. It's a common garden object. So everyone's going to need to protect this new nature from the older one that's kind of tougher and been around for longer. So this herbicide sprayer is grown in seven different components. We worked with a, an illustrator called Sean App Thomas to try and visualize this. We decided that we need to keep you know, Jim's kind of comments in mind. Jim was like, well, remember plant morphogenesis and gravity and all the how does this work? So there's seven different components. Um, they're grown and then they'd be harvested and then assembled afterwards. It starts off with the um, herbicide gourd, which is like a big kind of melon that you put over your arm. And there's the spike that slots into it. Um, and then here you have a connector that kind of grows and kind of like, like a nut. Um, these long tubes grow in um, kind of a solution that kind of form hollow roots. And on the end of that, you put a nozzle, which is from a plant related to a tomato. So we're kind of going through botanical books, trying to work out what these things were, where they came from. The poor illustrator was completely overwhelmed. Um, this is a flexor, flexor cable that wraps around it, and the handle grows upside down, taking advantage of gravity. In the end, all you need um, are seeds, because you don't want them to ship kind of whole products around the world. You just have to ship seeds, and all the manufacturing instructions are encoded in the DNA. So what was interesting about is this is that we could then go back to the Hasselhoff lab and be like, well, this is what we thought you meant. Um, and that was kind of, that began the next project, um, which James will introduce. So, um, so Daisy's connection with the Hasselhoff Laboratory in Cambridge University, which is, it's a plant sciences department, um, but they're also responsible for running the Cambridge University iGen team. So iGen is a competition um, run by MIT every year and it's grown kind of exponentially since it first started, I think, in 2004? Anyway, so it's, it's pretty young. Um, but now it, it, it attracts about 1,000 students in 120 teams um, uh, who all spend uh, about 10 weeks over the summer um, working in the lab um, on... Generally, it's bacteria that do something novel or interesting, and uh, they use the... the the biobricks, um, which come from the, the, the biobricks registry in their system. Um, so here's an example of one of the uh, applications that they come up with for the competition. So um, this is the University of Austin, Texas, and uh, the University of um, UCSF. UCSF. San Francisco. Um, <laughs> San Francisco. Um, and this is a, 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 an agar place, but it's been covered with a lawn of um, 
of photo, uh, photosensitive bacteria that go dark in the presence of light. So it's effectively a living photographic film. Um, and this is uh, quite a famous project. It was done by um, Harvard? MIT. MIT. Um, in 2000 and something. <laughs> and sorry, the facts are very poor in this section of the, of the talk. Um, uh, but it's, um, it's basically uh, an attempt to make bacteria or E. coli bacteria smell better. So what they did was they um, found the, uh, the genes that would, uh, that would turn salicylic, salicylic acid um, into methyl salicylate, which is wintergreen, um, which is the same stuff that you get in chewing gum. And uh, they got the bacteria to express it, and then the bacteria don't smell awful, they smell of mint. And they did the same thing for banana. And uh, what was nice, because they were based at MIT, they were allowed to bring their genetically modified organism into the conference centre. So they're one of the only teams that can actually bring what they've made in the lab in and allow people to kind of smell it and sniff it. And they did a, they did a kind of a, a smell test so people um, could kind of judge themselves whether they succeeded or not. Um, they didn't win the competition. Um, so at the beginning of the summer, we started work with the Cambridge IGN team. Um, we all came from a, a variety of different backgrounds. Um, they came from engineering, uh, biology, physics. Um, there are a few uh, maths people in there as well. Um, computer science. And um, what was nice about it was that they ran a two-week course um, for this quite general audience when you consider you know, what they've been learning beforehand and really introduced them to synthetic biology. And that meant that Daisy and I, who don't have any background in science or engineering, could um, follow along on the course. So we did, uh, we did lectures in the morning quite intensively, and in the afternoon we did lab practicals. Um, and we're just kind of basically another member of the team for this, this two-week period. So after the two weeks, the, the, the Cambridge students, their job really was to decide what they were going to make for the iGEM competition. And um, this is really interesting for us because uh, when we're starting a project, often the question is, what should we design? And, and that's really the same process that they were going through, um, even though they, you know, they, their education was really about learning things, not about how to design things, necessarily. Um, so Cambridge decided that they wanted to produce bacteria, um, that, or different strains of E. coli, that would produce different coloured pigments. And they would use these pigments in uh, genetic circuits, so the same sorts of circuits that produce wintergreen or photosensitive um, bacteria. But these genetic circuits might be biosensors, so um, the bacteria might be um, uh, sensitive to something like arsenic, and then would produce the corresponding coloured pigment according to what it was sensing in the environment. Which meant that if you um, if you were worried that some groundwater had arsenic poisoning in it, you could then um, take a sample of it, drop in your bacteria, your modified bacteria, and if it went red overnight, then um, there was too much arsenic in it to drink. So it's a great kind of application. Um, for places like Bangladesh or even California, where groundwater arsenic poisoning is a real problem. We suggested they call them e-chromine. Um, and we, we designed this logo, um, not really for them, it was really for us, because we were, we were doing design projects at the time based on their work. Um, but they used it anyway, which is not really what we intended, but quite interesting what they did. Um, but what we were really interested in was the... Um, the implications of the technology that they were developing right then and there in front of our eyes. So we saw two general applications for it. Uh, one used in signaling, as in the biosensor, which I just described, and the other used as an end product. So um, colour could be produced in bacteria, and then that pigment could be extracted for use in food, maybe, or the textile industry, or even in paint or something like that. Um, but what were the implications for this technology? So rather than designing pure applications as designers might do normally, we decided to focus on four different types of things. So groups. Groups of people might um, base their livelihood on e-chroma in some way, just as you have kind of painters, painters and decorators. You know, what are the, what's the equivalent in the future of people dealing with uh, bacterial colour? Um, products and services are ways that people can buy and use the technology in their everyday lives, and laws might be needed to regulate it in some sort of way. Um, so we came up with, I think, seven different design proposals, and we placed them on a timeline stretching about 100 years into the future. And the proposals begin quite modestly. Um, so beginning in 2009, Cambridge developed eChromi, the base technology. And by 2010, we had the first um, arsenic biosensor, which is uh, made commercially available for testing groundwater in areas of risk of contamination. By 2015, there's a new profession of people whose job it is to scour the biosphere um, looking for new pigments and collect the genes responsible, bringing them back for use in the food and textile industry. 
By 2029, we have small microfluidic devices containing arrays of E. promy bacteria that respond to an enormous number of chemical signals. They can test effectively for anything, which is very useful for the neurotic consumer. In 2049, we propose a method for cheap personalized disease monitoring, and I'll come back to this later. And in 2069, the biotech arm of Google releases pollution mapping E. chromi into the atmosphere that turn red in the presence of excess CO2. And as the saying goes, red sky in the morning, Google health warning. The bacteria recognize no national borders, and a major diplomatic incident ensues when they enter Chinese airspace. By 2099, we have total ambient sensing. So colour is no longer used as a means of decoration. Instead, it's used on every surface, constantly relaying information to us. So after we, we created this timeline, we presented it to the Cambridge team, um, kind of sat them down and showed them our designs and kind of a bit nervous. Um, and it's about three weeks into their process. Yeah, yeah, so they decided they wanted to make colour and then we, we came with this. And then what we wanted them to do was to kind of repeat what we'd just done. So we'd left gaps in the timeline. And we had an afternoon with them, with all of the um, all of their professors away on holiday, um, and just them and their super, uh, kind of uh, PhD supervisors um, kind of around. And uh, we got them to come up um, with their own design proposals and really fill in the gaps on our timeline. So um, one group uh, who were given kind of a near future date um, cast themselves as food marketeers, and they made a prop which was a, a kind of a, a big vessel full of um, full of what they called kelp which had been genetically modified to express a red pigment, which they would then tell the public that they would extract and, and put in food, and what did the public think about this? And um, what was nice was they learned how to tell a story about their work, and although it wasn't exactly what they're doing in the lab, it was close enough to get feedback on, on the types of technology that they were developing. And um, interestingly, although it wasn't a statistically significant sample size, um, the few people they talked to said that they might be more amenable to this over chemical, um, or colour produced by the chemical industry, as they saw it as maybe more natural. Um, so in 2039, we have the Orange Liberation Front, which is a terrorist organisation from the Netherlands. Um, they're angry because uh, the colour orange and its means of production has been patented by a Chinese biotech company, and they can no longer wear their national colour to represent their national football team and must instead wear red and yellow close together. Um, they have developed a bomb filled with an the antibiotic canamycin, which they're threatening to explode at London Fashion Week, destroying all of the colour, reducing everyone to their level. Um, and all the colour by that stage is produced bacterially, so their plan will probably work. Um, and in 2089, we have the colourists, who are led by Dr James Brown, um, who is the first scientist to ever experiment with dynamic skin pigmentation. Um, unfortunately, he experimented on himself and uh, ended up a permanent purple colour, so it wasn't very dynamic. <laughs> but um, after a few years, the technology starts to get better, and um, the, the kind of the engineers and researchers that follow him start to get more control over the pigmentation of their of their skin until eventually the technology matures. And this is Vivian, and she's actually naked, except you wouldn't realise it because she's expressing the appearance of clothing by carefully modulating the pigmentation of her skin. So this all happened in an afternoon, both us presenting the design proposals and, and then coming up with their own ideas. And um, After that, they went back to the lab and the kind of the hard grind of cloning, uh, uh, incubating, sequencing, pipetting, all the sorts of things that they've been doing before. But um, they went back with a, a different perspective on their work. Um, and um, meanwhile, Daisy and I decided that we'd like to develop one of the, the design proposals further, um, the one that I brushed over on the timeline. So it's a proposal for... Um, cheap um, personalised disease monitoring, and um, it can be bought from supermarkets as a simple probiotic drink. Um, in the drink are suspended uh, granules containing small numbers of E. chromi bacteria, which when ingested form a permanent colony in the gastrointestinal tract, and constantly monitor for chemical signals that indicate the presence of a wide range of diseases. Um, the basic version monitors most of the common intestinal problems, but it can be tailored to you personally based on your genetic profile and what you're more susceptible to. If the bacteria detect a disease, they, they start to generate the corresponding coloured pigments, which can be easily um, seen in the, in, in the output of the system, i.e. your poop. Um, so it's important at this point to, to kind of reiterate that um, while Daisy and I are both fascinated by synthetic biology, we try to maintain a sense of ambivalence and keep questioning it. And um, 
there's a kind of a lot of talk about biological computing and uh, medical applications to SimBio. And really for us, it was obvious that one of the prime um, interfaces between this kind of technology and the body might be in the gut. And um, it kind of made sense that uh, something like this could be used um, quite usefully, although it's not the kind of application that would maybe win a grant or something like that, because it's not the sexiest of technologies. Um, so we decided to take this as a kind of provocation to the, to the IGEM Jamboree, where, um, as you saw from the photograph, about a thousand students and their, and their um, uh, supervisors all come together and form a, um, a, a big kind of conference. Um, so what we did was we packed a, um, a sample of the scaffold into this metal suitcase, um, which we could easily carry around the, the conference centre, um, and kind of uh, open it up at unsuspecting delegates and kind of show them what we'd, uh, what we'd come up with, kind of like a proud kid with a potty in his mum. Um, and the project received a wide range of reactions, um, sometimes unfavourable, um, and sometimes very enthusiastic. This is uh, a, t a team of um, uh, students from Bogota who are all about 15. They're very young for an IGEN team. Um, we talked to many of the big names in synthetic biology. So standing in the middle here is um, Tom Knight, who's the founder of the Biobricks Registry. Um, and we even talked to people like the UN and the FBI, who were there sponsoring the competition, because they wanted to, um, to talk to people about uh, bioterrorism and also to put a human face on the FBI in that, you know, if you saw someone doing something dodgy in the lab, you could go and talk to Special Agent Dan rather than the FBI, which is maybe less scary. Um, so each of the conversations that we had allowed us uh, an opportunity to explore the expectations, the hopes and the fears of the people working in this nascent field. Um, meanwhile, Cambridge did incredibly well in the competition, um, so well, in fact, that they won the grand prize um, by uh, beating all of the other 112 teams, um, and they also won the environmental prize. And uh, we were enormously kind of proud of, to be working with them and to kind of help them, um, well, help them with their projects in some way, even if we weren't doing the, the hard work ourselves. Um, and one of the nicest things that kind of came out of this was um, a blog post which uh, one of the students wrote as soon as they arrived off the plane back in London after the Jamboree. And I'll just read out a small section of it now. You probably won't be able to read it there. But um, one of the things about working in a research lab is that it's very easy to get lost in the little world you're currently working in. Day-to-day -day research really is little picture stuff. While you know that your work has bigger implications and you drag them out of the filing cabinet every time you want to write a grant application, you don't often have the time or the inclination just to sit down and think about where your work could go. This is why scientists need friends, and I discovered over the summer that this especially applies to friends who are also art and design students. Because while you're busy squinting at gels and trying to convince yourself that you have a band two kilobases long, they're getting excited about the fact that you have purple bacteria, actual purple bacteria, and they're thinking of all the amazing things that you can do with that. I'm still recovering from jet lag, so I'll try to put this into context by using this picture. This is what I see. And this is, a, and this is what they see. Um, so what was really lovely was that um, although they didn't present the design work that they'd come up with in our workshop, because it wasn't really in the kind of the place in the competition. Um, it was really nice to have some kind of confirmation that uh, what we've kind of done with them was maybe useful or help them to think about their work in a broader context than just, you know, genes and um, sequencing and gels and all that kind of thing. Um, so the good thing about Cambridge winning was that the, um, they received a lot of attention from the press at the Jamboree, and we also kind of um, piggybacked on that as well. And um, all sorts of things happened, such as... Uh, um, Vivian, who was one of the student members of the team, appearing on National Public Radio on Science Friday, which is broadcast across America, talking about the project. And currently, in the windows of the Wellcome Trust, um, eChroma is currently on display. Um, both the kind of, well, mainly it's the design side, but the, the bio brick, which is the, the, the prize that the, um, the students won, is on display there as well, which is rather good. So I'll just pass over to Daisy to talk about um, what she's been doing, kind of in parallel to this project. and. and I also add that um, James also ran other workshops while because I was in I was, going to say, I was in Australia, and so our collaboration with them kind of went on over the summer. That James ran a second workshop about colour theory and really trying to help them think about the systems that they were kind of working on. So it was this evolving process over the summer that started off with us just sort of going to the you know, two-week crash course and then kind of developed into this full-on collaboration that was never quite what anyone expected, but sort of set an interesting precedent. So while James was kind of 
the colour space, doing colour systems with the Cambridge team. I was in, um, I was starting a, a residency in Australia at Symbiotica, um, like James mentioned earlier, um, which is a really kind of interesting art and science collaborative laboratory at the University of Western Australia, founded by Orin Katz and Ian Atsur. And this kind of, it's been set up through the university now that artists can come in and do residencies. They've had about 50 residents so far and actually collaborate directly with scientists. So projects go forward if there's animal testing involved and are put towards the ethics board of the university and things are kind of judged on scientific merit as well as artistic research merit. There's no synthetic biology happening yet at Symbiotica or at the University of Western Australia, so I propose that maybe I'd go along and see if there was a way of kind of starting something up or thinking about it there. But I've also been very interested in DIY bio, which is another aspect of this kind of field where people are trying to reclaim the open source kind of side of um, synthetic biology. So while iGEM kind of maintains this open source nature, that there's this parts registry, the BioBrix bio registry, um, where people will kind of create new parts and components, um, there's obviously the argument that, you know, how is this all going to be patented and what's going to happen and will it remain open? So DIY bio um, has been started up with people trying to do garage biology, do it at home, salad spinner PCRs and you know, all sorts of things which might not be necessarily the best idea but offer a really interesting insight into how we can kind of keep it open. Um, so I was wondering what kind of role could I have in a laboratory where I'm authorised to order genetic components and use these kinds of technologies. Um, another question was like, at what point do I become a scientist? If I'm practising synthetic biology, am I a synthetic biologist? What is a synthetic biologist? Um, could the kind of research I do as a designer be useful in a laboratory? Would there ever be a role? We kind of Drew Endy saying, oh, you know, one day we won't need to go through this whole research process. What would that be like? So I didn't manage to get that far. Um, I kind of tripped up on all sorts of problems, like if there's no synthetic biology happening and I'm starting it up, where does that leave me ethically, morally? I'm not trying to promote it, but suddenly I'd be kind of kick-starting a research area at a university, which sort of seemed to be where it was heading, and that worried me. Um, so this is something that's kind of... I did three months there, and it was fascinating, so I got to learn a lot more about molecular biology, spent time learning how to use a gene gun, which is what's pictured here, and following um, scientists in her laboratory, and doing her work with her for three weeks. Um, but the kind of the role of the designer starts to come a bit blurry in what sort of what function I had there. So at the moment, um, I'm just starting on a project called Synthetic Aesthetics with Jane Calvert and Alistair Elphick from um, Edinburgh and Drew ND from Stanford. And this is a very exciting project that we're just starting where we're going to be sending six synthetic, this is the only diagram that I made this morning, six scientists, and Jane was like, which colour is which? I don't know. Six scientists will be going into six um, design or art um, schools or studios and vice versa. So we'll have these series of exchanges and the idea is to see how new kinds of collaborations coming out of that. So that's going to be very interesting to kind of see how, hopefully like with eChroma has been a kind of a precedent for this to show how it's actually, the role isn't just the commentary, which is um, kind of the field that we've come from is also known as critical design or design for debate, where the design is sort of creating visual commentary on what's happening, trying to explore it, but actually see if design itself can be useful in a laboratory and vice versa and what kinds of new interactions there are. So that's the website, which everyone hopefully knows about it already, project, um, but yeah, more soon. So Jane's going to talk about another, his new project now. Um, so I'm currently working on um, an EPSRC funded project um, with a team of scientists in uh, Nottingham University, Oxford and Glasgow and um, I've been paired up with them and what they're doing is uh, uh, producing minimal lifelike constructs um, in vitro and in silico um, called, what do they call chemical cells in that they're not based on the same chemistry that uh, a normal organic life is. Um, instead they're, they're based on kind of different chemistry entirely. But they're doing the research in order to find out what life is. And um, this is something that uh, I've been tasked to find what this, the impact of this research might be on society. Um, so I'm also very much interested that at the moment um, I talk to quite a few synthetic biologists and they all talk about biology in that it's technology. And um, there's no real definition for them or for anyone I've spoken to, um, what the difference is between a living technology and a non-living technology, other than the, 
operational differences and the kind of the difficulties of working with it or the you know, kind of mechanical differences if you if you like there's no notion of, of what living matter and non-living matter is um, and how they're different and why technologies based on non-living matter um, might be needed treat, to be treated differently to, to living technologies so um, the project is really about discovering a, a useful definition of life for application in the field of synthetic biology. Um, so in the past, um, we have struggled to define what constitutes the difference between living and non-living things. Um, the concept of vitalism, that there's a non-physical component to life, or a soul if you like, has fallen out of fashion. Um, the prevailing doctrine is that life is an emergent property of biochemical processes. Molecular biologists have tried to understand these processes by performing traditional reductionist experiments on living organisms in order to find out what makes them tick. But we're still very far away from understanding how all pieces fit together to form more than the sum of their parts and create living, breathing, thinking things. So um, the, the type of uh, methodology that um, the, the researchers that I'm working with is more, very much akin to um, uh, iGen and that type of synthetic biology in that they're, they're not looking to discover something, they're actually trying to build it. So we're not searching in the black hoping something happens, we're really trying to engineer these things. So rather than philosophizing or doing reductive science, the Chell team are focusing on creating. Here's an example of one of their experiments that Lee Cronin, one of the researchers, kindly emailed me. Lee calls this an inorganic living system. The team are developing an operational definition of life by engineering living things from scratch. If they're successful, they'll be able to demonstrate how life emerges from matter and what the vital characteristics of living things actually are. The Shell team wants to build more complex systems with metabolisms, reproductive capabilities, and the ability to interact with other cells. And they call these systems chemical cells, or shells. If they are successful, they'll be able to demonstrate how life emerges from matter and what the vital characteristics of living things actually are. But there is a complication. The shells are based on a very different chemistry, and therefore they share very little in common with natural, organic life. So how will the researchers determine that the shells they create are actually alive? How will they know if they succeeded? The answer is um, based on the idea of Alan, Alan Turing, who at the time um, was struggling with this um, philosophical debate about whether machines could or could not think, and proposed a device called the Turing test, um, which is quite simple. It's if an interrogator um, can talk to a computer and talk to a human being, but can't tell the difference between them because there's a screen in front of them and the conversation is natural to them in both cases, then the computer, which is performing the conversation, has effectively passed the Turing test and could be considered to be thinking. Um, so they've proposed a very similar test in that they have their chemical cells and their, and their uh, naturally evolved cells, and um, uh, a human um, interrogator will, will see if they can tell the difference between the, the natural and unnatural cells, um, given certain screens and certain devices. Um, and also, more interestingly, interrogator cells, natural cells, will also try and um, determine the difference between the, the chemical cells and the natural cells. And, maybe treat them differently in the same way. Um, but there is a problem. Um, in the same way that uh, Turing's test um, is only really testing one facet of, of, of um, human capability, that idea, I, I, the idea that we can think, um, the, the child Turing test is also only testing one facet, um, this kind of communication between living and non-living cells. So it doesn't really answer this question, um, whether they're kind of different, uh, dead or alive. Um, but I think this is actually the wrong question. Um, so rather than asking whether the child's are dead or alive, this research actually needs to ask a different question. How alive are they? Um, the child Turing test is only a first step towards defining what life is. Once the team have developed a child that passes it, they can then define a more stringent Turing test that requires the child to imitate more complex cellular behaviour. And then a third test, and a fourth, and gradually, piece by piece, test by test, a definition of what it means to be alive will emerge until eventually so what these non-organic non living systems will look like is a matter of speculation, but they will be operationally alive, and by creating them and testing them, the child team will have provided an answer to the question, what is life? But um, this will be a very different way of understanding life to what we are used to. The research will create a cellularity scale bridging living and non-living matter. That there is no clear distinction between living and non-living things, that there is instead a continuum between being dead and being alive will strike many people as counterintuitive and perhaps controversial. So what are the implications of this cellularity scale for society? In the field of synthetic biology, um, if it leads to the creation of living technologies in the future, how alive might they be? 
For instance, your toilet cleaner product might contain vesicles classified as 10% alive, while your pet dog might be classified as 95% alive. Will Turing test be used within ethical and legal frameworks to differentiate between different levels on the cellularity scale? An example of one of these more stringent Turing tests might be the Voigt Kampf machine from Blade Runner. Perhaps how these tests are defined um, and performed will become a feature of our material world around us. So um, I think that's the end of the kind of the project phase. And um, really, we'd like to talk about this issue here. It's very small. Responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, because I guess the majority of people in this room are maybe coming from a social sciences background, and we'd be very, very interested to hear your views on whether, or what, just what you think of mm. us, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and it, some of the questions that we wrote down after the set, we gave a talk yesterday at, um, in the engineering department, and it was interesting the kind of questions that were coming up there, which are the questions we often get, um, in the, you know, what is the role of design, how is it different to art, what is the role of design in this way? Are we just glossing over subjects? Are we actually still lay people? Some of the good questions yesterday, because um, although you know we're not, we have no scientific background, we're learning as much science as possible. And I had an interesting conversation with Jane at lunch today about this. Is like how much do you have to know to be able to interact? And you know, when I studied architecture, I had to learn um, engineering or basic construction engineering as a way of being able to have those kinds of conversations. So other questions that we kind of jotted down here were ideas of are we promoting, can we remain impartial, um, are there precedents that we can be looking at for like our working method, can we look to social science, because, or are we repeating things that have been done before? Um, and yeah, any, please, yeah, any questions would be very welcome. Thanks very much. <laughs>